presumptive Democrat nominee for the most hilarious presumptive dom- Democrat nominee for president ever, Joe Biden, says he would pick Michelle Obama as his vice president in a heartbeat. In a speech made to the basement door in the hopes it would open and let him out, Biden said, quote, of course I would pick Michelle Obama. She's cute as a button, her skin is incredibly soft, and her hair smells so great I could just bury my face in it forever. Also, here's a funny coincidence. I actually used to know a guy named Obama, which is not all that common a name. It's a long time ago now, but as I recall, he was a colored fellow, except he was articulate and bright and clean. I don't remember what he did for a living, but he wasn't a gangster or anything like that. I used to know a gangster named of Corn Pop or Popcorn or Pop Tart or something, and he was a tough character who used to come around and make fun of the hair on my legs because I was a lifeguard back then, and my leg hair would turn all blonde in the sunshine, and Popeye would say to me, hey, blondy legs, what happened to your leg hairs? So I wrapped the chain around my fist and beat him to death. But I don't think he was any relation to this Obama guy, even though they both were black. I just think it's funny that this Michelle person has such a similar name. Anyway, it would be great to have such a hot babe around the White House. By the way, does she have a daughter? Unquote. Contacted at her $12 million vacation home on Martha's Vineyard, which she and her husband purchased with the spare change from their $65 million book deal and their $50 million Netflix deal, Mrs. Obama said she was delighted that Biden said he would pick her for vice president or indeed any other sentence that halfway made sense. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. Life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky dunky doo. Ship shaped, tipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hooray, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hooray! So I don't know about you, but personally, I was fascinated by my talk yesterday with Christopher Caldwell of the Claremont uh, Review of Books about his new book, The Age of Entitlement. Uh, The premise of the book is that civil rights law, by essentially stripping us of our right to associate with whomever we please, by turbocharging the growth of government and by giving trial lawyers the opportunity to sue us for our speech and opinions, has set up a parallel constitution that actually opposes and nullifies the constitution that made us free. When advertisers run in terror after a couple of Twitter trolls call someone a bigot or when corporations fire employees for opinions they disagree with, it's the fear of these civil rights lawsuits and government sanctions that strip them of their courage and commitment to American values. I've always hated racial bigotry. It seems to me both a sinful insult to the image of God and a violation of America's founding values, which pretty much puts it beyond the pale in my book. But yet one more of the many ways that politics makes us stupid is by causing us to meet temporary problems with faulty systems that turn out to be essentially permanent. There is no longer any institutional racism in America. It's all completely gone. By that, I mean our institutions are free of racism. But who is going to stand up and say civil rights law is a problem when we haven't even got anyone who's willing to stand up and say that social security entitlements are a problem? One of the reasons I haven't been willing to join the right-wing scream chorus about lockdown during the Chinese virus crisis is not because I don't think clowns like Gretchen Whitmer and Bill de Blasio in New York are bad hats. They're awful, awful people. They would be tyrants if they could. But while I do think we should cautiously begin to reopen the economy, I don't think state and local emergency measures taken during a health crisis represent a systemic threat to my freedom. And it's the systemic threats that really worry me. The unbridled power of government agencies, the leftist corruption of our education and communication systems, entitlements and the debt, Supreme Court decisions that essentially read the meaning right out of the Constitution, the use of lawsuits to enforce fear and limit free speech. These things are real, they're pervasive, and they're creeping. They slowly get bigger and bigger. They need to be dismantled and prevented from returning. But solutions are very difficult and long term, and just talking about them causes anxiety. And it's much easier to scream and yell about the outrage of the moment. And there are outrages, but it's much easier to scream and yell about those outrages than to discuss the slow, pervasive smothering of our constitutional rights. The virus is going to pass. Gretchen Whitmer is going to pass. Bill de Blasio will pass, though it would make me laugh if he was tarred and feathered and hurled into the Hudson River even before he passed. 
But, but civil rights law, entitlements, deep state bureaucracies, these are the long wars we have to fight and the sort of encroachments on our freedoms we have to prevent in the future. And they're going to still be here when these Democrat clowns and their overreach are long gone. All right, let us talk about LegalZoom. Look, during the crisis like this, you're going to be thinking about things that you don't like to think about. This is a time when you want to say, you know what, estate planning, not a bad idea. Last will and testament, living trust, not a bad idea to make those now while there's time. That's why LegalZoom continues to provide a reliable way for everyone to set up the right estate plan, the right will, without leaving your home. You don't have to figure everything out on your own. LegalZoom's online resources make it easy to get started. And if you need to speak to an attorney, their independent attorney network is there to guide and advise you. LegalZoom isn't a law firm, so you won't have to worry about expensive billable hours adding up. But these are things you got to take care of and you need some advice to do it and you need uh, the forms and the systems to do it. LegalZoom provides it all. Take an important step for your family today. Go to LegalZoom.com to get started on a last will, living trust, and more. And make sure you enter code Claven to check out for special savings. That's LegalZoom.com, code Claven. LegalZoom, where life meets legal. You do not have to go to law school to find out how to spell Claven. It's easy. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Or someone spelled it in Australia. <laughs> someone spelled it in an Australian TV show the other day, C-L-A-V-I-N. I don't think they're quoting me. Somehow they didn't find out how to spell my name, but at least there are no E's in C-L-A-V-I-N. All right, the mailbag will come up today uh, and we will solve all your problems. So you want to stay tuned for that. You will, that's what you'll sound like by the end of the show. That's what you will sound like. Uh, Today, I'm going to talk about something I find bizarre, which is that right now, in the current situation, Donald Trump has become the smartest person in America. OK, now that, the reason I call that bizarre is because obviously Donald Trump is not the smartest person in America. I know this because I'm the smartest person in America. And the thing that has got me that I find bizarre is that when I watch all the different people talking, when I read all the stuff that I read and I read a lot of stuff, the person that I agree with almost continually in this crisis has been Donald Trump, which makes him the smartest person in America. And how did that happen? I mean, you know, the other, the other day I, I pointed out that he has to steer the American ship between Charbatus and Scylla. Charbatus and Scylla were monsters in Greek mythology. And they were in a Mediterranean strait and you had to steer between them. Some people say it was really a cliff on one side and a whirlpool on the other. But the point is, it's not like it's not like being between a rock and a hard place. It's sort of like that. But the thing is, there's a space between and you have to be able to get through without being sucked into one monster or the other monster. And as I spoke those words, as I said, Trump has to steer the country between Charbatus and Scylla, the joke immediately popped up in the back of my head. And he doesn't even know who Charbatus and Scylla are, you know, and of course, he doesn't know who Charbatus and Scylla are, and he hasn't got the highest IQ in the world. He's a very stable genius, I understand. And yet I keep feeling that, in, you know, all the mistakes, people make mistakes, but he has really essentially got this right. And I've started to think, well, how is that? How did that happen? How did he become the smartest people in America when he's surrounded by all these people who think they're a lot smarter than he is? One thing I've noticed about Trump is that he talks funny. You know, the other day, Katie Tour sent out this tweet that Kim Jong-un in North Korea was brain dead. It turns out that that was not good reporting. Well, she's from CNN, so saying it's not good reporting is kind of repetitive. But they asked uh, Trump about the report before they, now they don't know what happened. He may have had, he may have had heart surgery. He seems to be out of commission. Here's what Trump said about Kim Jong-un. These are reports that came out and uh, we don't know. We don't know. I've had a very good relationship with him. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I can only say this, I wish him well, because uh, uh, if he is in the kind of condition that the reports say, that the news is saying, that would be a, uh, that's a very serious condition, as you know, but I wish him well. It's a very serious condition if he's brain dead. And I, you know, we have a very good relationship. He talks funny. He says funny things when he talks. It's almost like he doesn't think on his feet that well. And so it's easy to call him stupid he, he doesn't read a lot. There are a lot of things he doesn't know. And yet he keeps getting this right. And I've been thinking about why that happened when all these other people have obviously got their heads up their wazoos. And here's what I found out. You know, the, the Senate just approved a new bill, a $484 billion bill to replenish the small business relief. And this is part of the cost, the debt we're going into because the, the economy is shut down and it's not producing money. And the Democrats wanted to spend more money on all their crazy nonsense. 
And the Senate finally pushed it through. And now Nancy Pelosi's on TV saying, well, it was the Democrats. It was Mitch McConnell who held it up. And the press is sitting there, you know, nodding because they lie. Trump, what is it that Trump does that he keeps getting this way? He keeps getting this right. We've got basically, when we talk about Sharpness and Silla, we talk about the two sea monsters. We've basically got the left saying we've got to shut down forever. Anybody who goes back is an idiot. Anybody who protests that their civil rights are in danger is a fool. And then we've got people on the right who are gathering together and saying we've got to just go back, just open the economy, you know, everything, anything that uh, threatens, that, that, uh, closes off my choices and my movements, even in an emergency, is a threat, an essential systemic threat to my freedom, which I don't agree with either. I don't agree with that either. I think we have to go back in a way that we don't have. The problem is if we go back too quickly, if we go back in a, in a mass and there's a second spike in the disease, the economy will shut down again, which will be even worse. That will be a, a disaster to have it shut down twice. So what does Trump say? Let me make sure I've got the right, uh, I give him the right cut number here, because Trump said a really interesting thing when they were asking about, about this. Cut, this is cut nine. Here was his response. We have to build back our country, and I'm going to make our country bigger and better and stronger, and we have to get started. There's a big difference, though, because people have really been through a lot, and they understand what to do now. Before, nobody had ever heard of a thing like this, wouldn't you say? I mean, nobody ever heard of a thing like this. Distancing, social distancing, what does that mean? Washing your hands every 15 minutes, what does that mean? I mean, people had never seen or heard about anything like this. Now they really are. They've, they've not only have they done it, but they've done a good job of it. But you have people, you can't break the country. At some point, you have to go back. Now, hopefully the governors are going to do, because I want the governors, and I've always wanted that. You could call it federalism. You can call it whatever you want. But the governors, I want them to do it. If they, if we see them doing something we don't like, we'll stop it very quickly. But they're doing a good job. They're being careful. I love that. You can call it federalism. You can call it whatever you like. I call it federalism. Why? Because it's federalism. He is letting the states take care of it. This is Look, this is a gigantic country. It's not a one size fit all country. Uh, 37% of the deaths right now, the latest numbers, and these numbers obviously are flexible, but the 37% of the deaths right now are in New York. New York has one problem, Montana, different set of circumstances. They should behave in a different way. He's trusting the governor. He's trusting the people. He's saying, look, this was an unprecedented event. That's right. That's correct. This is an unprecedented event in our lifetimes. We haven't seen anything like this. So the people didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to be cautious. They didn't, they might have done stuff that would have overwhelmed the healthcare system. And as I said the other day, it's not how many deaths, it's how many deaths in how short a time in how small a place. Okay. So if all, if 37% of the deaths are in New York and you've got bodies lining Broadway, that's going to have an emotional effect on the, on the country that is going to be incredibly damaging. No one's coming out of their house after that. If you see that on TV, believe me, that will change the whole tenor of the country. And that's not what you want. You do not want the economy shutting down out of fear anyway, either. So what is Trump doing? When Trump says this, he's trusting, he's trusting the system. He's keeping federalism alive in a crisis, which is very, very rare in a crisis. Obviously, the federal government loves to seize power. He's not doing that. He's trusting the people. He's not doing the stuff that I'm going to show you in a little while. I'm going to show you some of the abuses that are going on, not just on the, on the street, but also in the media, the abuses of, of regular people just trying to live their lives and the overreach of people trying to enforce this stuff. He's trusting them. Ronald Reagan, when he gave uh, his farewell address, and I remember this, and I actually remember this statement. It has always stuck with me. Play, play, this is part of Reagan's farewell address when he was leaving office. And in all of that time, I won a nickname, the great communicator. But I never thought it was my style or the words I used that made a difference. It was the content. I wasn't a great communicator, but I communicated great things, and they didn't spring full bloom from my brow. They came from the heart of a great nation, from our experience, our wisdom, and our belief in the principles that have guided us for two centuries. I wasn't a great communicator. I communicated great things. <laughs> Trump is not, a, is not a great communicator. As, you know, sometimes he gives great speeches, but he, even then he doesn't read them all that well. He's not a great speaker. I, as I said before, he says funny things. He may not know who Charbatus and Sill are, but he knows where they are. He may not have read the Constitution. I suspect he hasn't read the Constitution, but he has an instinctive sense of what it says. And by being in office, he has learned where the limitations are and what 
his people, the conservative people, the constitutional people, what they expect of him. The people who are smarter than Donald Trump are too smart for the great ideas that made them who they are and made this country what they are. We know this. It's not, it's not me just making it up. It's not me just throwing insults at them. We know that the New York Times thinks this country was founded to protect slavery. Literally, factually untrue. They've been told it's literally factually untrue, but they're still spreading this project. It's going to be taught in schools, this uh, 1619 project, they call it. They know it's untrue, but the narrative is correct because they know the narrative. They know the moral nar- narrative better. They know better than John Adams. They know better than James Madison. They know better than the things that created the situation that allowed the New York Times to become a once great newspaper, now a piece of garbage. They're so smart that they're idiots. They're so smart that they've seen past the right things. Because part of, you know, when people are smart, a lot of times they get uh, narcissistic about their intelligence. I don't think they keep calling Trump a narcissist, but Trump has released power. He has less power. When have you seen a president even a Republican president, even Reagan, by the way, when have you seen a president give up the powers of the presidency? Donald Trump has done that. He has cut down on the imperial presidency. You know, the other day, uh, Yamish was yesterday, Yamish Alcindor, the leftist activist who pretends to be a reporter for uh, PBS. She was complaining, play this, she was complaining that Trump takes uh, everything personally. What we've seen is that these White House briefings have increasingly turned into campaign style events. And the president is very understanding of the fact that this is the only way that he's able to communicate with the American people. So we've started to see him do really interesting things. The first thing that I would point out is that he's starting to say that talking about testing is somehow a personal attack against him. I posed that question to him a couple days ago and the president said, no, it's not a personal attack on me. But people are talking about this because they want to take me down politically and they're thinking about the November election as a talk about testing, which of course is a critical thing that that Americans everywhere, Republicans and Democrats, they all want testing to be expanded. It's critical to reopening the government. But the president is so aware of the fact that it's part of that's part of his reelection campaign and part of something that might might hurt him, that he's really now trying to push off testing completely to a state issue and not really taking any sort of responsibility for the testing issues that are still ongoing. You are too smart to be acting this dumb. Now, why would President Trump take questions as a personal attack. Our friends at Media Research Center put together this montage of some of the most important, most prominent journalists in the country and how they've been reporting this story. This is cut one. In electing Donald J. Trump as president, the American people did the most reckless thing they have ever done in our history. This is what happens when you elect a sociopath as president. All his worst qualities his mendaciousness, his uh, his constant telling of lies. His delays, his incompetence, his ignorance has turned deadly. Dangerous. 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 This will be something that's paid in human lives, and that's an enormous tragedy. Do you think President Trump is responsible for the deaths of Americans? What is President Trump's level of culpability? Do you think there is blood on the president's hands, considering the slow response? He became the chaos president, but what the American people want right now, and they're not getting, is a coronavirus president, and and a, a chaos president just isn't fitting the bill. This isn't reality TV anymore. People are dying and this guy is acting a fool. Is there anything or anyone that can tell him to pump the brakes or at least pretend to care about the loss of life? CNN sucks. (laughs) It's possible that every one of those people, with the exception of Jim, look at me, I'm Jim Acosta, has read more than Donald Trump. It really is. It's possible they have. It, I, I, I doubt they have higher IQs, but, but it's possible that even that is possible. But they have left behind the traditions of their, uh, the, the principles of their profession of journalism. They've left behind the, the principles of their profession of journalism. They have left behind their love of the principles that form the country. They do not support the Constitution. They have told us this. They've told us this again and again. Free, we're weaponizing free speech. Free speech has become a bad thing. Free speech is not going to protect us. We know they don't. Trump does. And it makes him brilliant. It makes him brilliant in the same way it made Reagan a great communicator. All right. 
We're going to talk about, you know, like I know a lot of us are not going anywhere, but that doesn't mean you don't need ring security. You do need ring security. Why? You're getting a lot of uh, deliveries, a lot of packages being left outside your house, a lot of people coming to your house. You still want to be able to look outside and see them and communicate with them safely. Ring doorbells will help you do that. Ring, it's really great. You know, not only the thing I like about rings, you don't have to get up. You don't have to get out of bed to check around the perimeter of your house. Uh, You know, with an all new ring doorbell three, it's upgraded. It's got additional security features. It works on any home. You can see and speak with visitors in HD video and two-way talk. You get phone notifications when your doorbell detects movement, adjusts what areas you get motion alerts for you. So uh, you not only receive alerts, you, you only receive the alerts you want to receive. Uh, the dual band Wi-Fi brings a more flexible and reliable connection. Get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit when you go to ring.com slash Clavin. The Welcome Kit includes the Ring Video Doorbell 3 and the Chime Pro. It's all you need to start building custom security for your home today, go to ring.com slash Clavin. That's ring.com slash Clavin. Anyone comes to your home, ask them, how do you spell Clavin? The failing New York Times, which is like so bad. (laughs) If they say that, it's Trump. Let them in. All right, let's talk about our civil rights because, you know, I don't believe our civil rights have become systemically under threat, but there are people acting stupidly. Here, this is what happened in Idaho. There were moms protesting lockdowns by taking their children for a play date. A lot of moms got together and took their children for a play date. A cop came in and threatened to arrest them if they dispersed. One of the moms said, go ahead, do it. And he was arrested. Here's some video of that. So, so you heard one of the moms screaming to the cop as a person, not as a police officer, as a person. <laughs> does this <laughs> does this make sense to you? And apparently, the guy said the cop said the Constitution is not in force in Idaho. He apparently said so. So you know that's a really good question. That's a good question. As a person, not as a police officer, does this make sense to you? Because because you know it, it was famously said that during World War II, when uh, after World War II, when the Americans and the Russians occupied and the British came in and they they d- divvied up Berlin, that a lot of times the Jews trying to escape to the American side, they tried to escape to the American side, and everybody else to the uh, get away from the Soviets and everybody else would stop them because the rules were the rules. And if you were living in a certain area, you were in the Soviet division and all the stuff. And the Americans would go like, yeah, I just didn't see you go by, you know, because Americans knew sometimes you have to break the rules to do the right thing. That cop has forgotten how to be an American. He has forgotten it. You know, I'm, I'm not saying he's a bad person. I'm just saying he's forgotten what we're doing here as a person. If it doesn't make sense, if you want Americans to obey the law, you got to make American laws, right? It's not an American law. If you've got, if you've got a mom handcuffed and I, okay, she was an actor. Activist. She was making a protest. But if you've got a man, mom handcuffed for taking her kid to the park, uh, you got to think about that. you got to ask yourself, am I making things better or am I making things worse? Bill Barr, the attorney general, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best people in the administration, uh, he says this stuff has got to stop. We have that clip. I think the president's guidance has been, uh, as I say, superb and very commonsensical. And I think a lot of the governors uh, are following that. And, uh, you know, to the extent that Governors don't and impinge on, on either civil rights or, or on the, the national commerce, our, our common market that we have here, then we'll have to address that. These are very, very uh, burdensome uh, impingements on liberties. And if we adopted them, we have to remember, for the limited purpose of slowing down the spread, that is, bending the curve, we didn't adopt them as the comprehensive way of dealing with this disease. 
That is that's exactly right. And that's the that's the thing I keep reminding you of. This is the other side of the story, even though I think, you know, yes, we should take care. We should put measures in place because we don't want that second spike to hurt the economy twice. And we certainly don't want a lot of people dying also. But but the point is, we were asked to lock down to flatten the curve so our hospitals would not be overwhelmed. You know, you say, well, the numbers didn't work out and we've talked about computer prog- uh, computer predictions and all this stuff and how they don't work. And they're just really spreadsheets made with computers. They're not that big a scientific deal. But we, you know, we talk about all that. But the point is, the leaders of the country have people's lives and welfare at stake and they don't know what's coming down the pike. So they're making decisions. And, you know, did they panic a little bit? Uh, maybe. But maybe that maybe panic was a reaction. If you're in an avalanche, panic is a good thing. Get out of the way. Right. So they said, OK, we got to flatten the curve. We can't have like I said, we can't have Broadway lined with corpses. They flattened the curve. The hospitals have not been overwhelmed. This is not the flu. The death rates are very high and they're very compact. They're in small spaces and they're in small periods of time. And that's a disaster, right? If it, it doesn't it doesn't matter if Montana is fine if New York is wiped off the face of the map. We're all going to feel that if New York is wiped off the face of the map. So we have to make sure that, that the hospitals in various places are not overwhelmed, but places are different. The curve has been flattened. It's time to start going back to work. The problem, the problem is, is this is not about right and left. It really isn't. This is about common sense. Like I said, it's, it's more about Charbonneau and Silla than it is about right and left, than it is about the right or the left. It's more about going between the two dangers that we face, which is the danger of a second spike and the danger of a depression, and getting to the other side. Trump has been doing this brilliantly. Let me play for you what's going over the airwaves. That I don't, I don't know how many people watch these clowns anymore, these, these uh, late night entertainers. They're getting millions and millions of dollars in salary. So I assume they're still bringing in millions and millions of dollars worth of advertising. That's my assumption. I don't know. Here's Jimmy Kimmel. And here's what he says about some of these protests for civil rights. Well, you know what they say? It ain't over till the fat lady screams crazy right wing talking points at a medical professional who's trying to save their families' lives. I'm starting to think these characters who support Trump might be suicidal. They seem to fight hardest for the things that will kill them. They want freedom to gather in large groups during an epidemic. They want guns. They want pollution. I figured it out. They want to die, and they're taking us down with them. It's like if the Titanic was headed towards the iceberg, and half of the passengers were like, can you please speed this thing up? But our president has full confidence that what these protesters are doing is not a problem. Shut up! <laughs> so, yeah, really. So, you, you know, do we have that, that clip of what yeah, we do? You know, tr- Trump has been saying these people are expressing their feelings about the places where they are. Uh, he said that they're taking care to stand six feet apart. I don't know if that's true or not. But basically, he said they're expressing their feelings in different states and different people have overstepped and some haven't overstepped. And, you know, that's he said the, the line he had that I loved was I'm for everybody. Here's Obama in 2011. This is the, the clip I didn't have time to play yesterday talking about the Occupy movement. And let's remember the Occupy movement was a bunch of unwashed radicals supporting anarchy and communism. That's what they were doing. They left litter wherever they went, they committed sexual uh, um, assault in many of the places they went. And the media sang their praises. The media said this is the protest that will define a generation. And they asked Obama about it. And here's what he said. This is cut 10. We had the biggest financial crisis since the Great Depression, huge collateral damage all throughout the country, all across Main Street. And yet, you're still seeing some of the same folks who acted irresponsibly uh, trying to fight efforts to crack down on abusive practices that got us into this problem in the first place. So yes, I think people are frustrated and you know, the, the, the protesters uh, are giving voice to a more broad-based frustration about how our financial system works. Nobody said a word about him encouraging lawlessness. Nobody said, nobody on the left, nobody in the mainstream media said a word about Obama. The other day, the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia 
said they were actively investigating the complaint against Joe Biden brought by Tara Reid, the woman who accused Biden of sexually assaulting her in 1993, pinning her to a wall and sticking his hand into her body. The Metropolitan Police Department is investigating that. Have you read about it? Is it anywhere? You remember Believe All Women? You remember Me Too? You remember all this stuff that they were telling us about how important this was? If, if you continually lie. And that's what it is. It's lying. It's lying when you tell us, oh, we must believe all women. It's a new movement. It's a great movement. It's important that the protests are heard. Dissent is patriotic. And then you say, oh, no, 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 wait. It's encouraging lawlessness. It doesn't matter when Biden does it. You know, it's th- this is a terrible thing. It, it, when Trump does what Obama did, it was right when Obama did it. But when Trump does it, it's wrong. if you lose the, fa- the trust of the people, you have no way of getting information out to them. You have no way of getting out information out to them. Why should we listen to anything they say if they lie to us? Why? Trump has not lost. He, he has not lost the trust of the people who trust him, right? We, we, the people, people like me who didn't like Trump, who don't still in some ways personally don't like Trump. He hasn't lost my trust. He's actually gained my trust because he's done the right thing in keeping with the principles that form this country. That to me makes him a very stable genius. All right. You know, I've been one of the things I'm predicting. There's a lot of experts. The experts are saying that it's not true. So, you know, it's probably true. I've been predicting there's going to be a baby boom after this is over. But it's not going to happen if you're not using beard supply. You're stuck in your home with your wife. I hope it's your wife. You're stuck in your home with your wife. You got to make yourself smell good and look good if you want the baby boom to happen. Even if you don't want the baby boom to happen, even if you just want to have some a good time with your wife. If you're sitting at home giving the quarantine beard a shot, you probably already know it's not as easy as it look. A beard can dry out. It can get itchy. It can look dumb. Beard Supply helps keep your beard healthy. It's free, soft, and smelling great. I've been using it. It's terrific. It is absolutely terrific. A little old for a baby boom. Still, you want to look good. Each Beard Supply beard oil is handcrafted from 100% natural ingredients with no synthetics, no mass market essentials, no sulfates, and no paraffin. This stuff is basically just squeezed right out of the earth directly onto your beard. It really smells good, really cleans your beard. For a short time, Beard Supply is offering my listeners 25% off. Just go to beardsupply.com and use the promo code Claven. Again, that's beardsupply.com. Use the promo code Claven. Do not let down the side. We want this baby boom to happen. So keep your beard looking nice with Beard Supply. And you got to know how to spell Claven too, if you want to have fun. Uh, <laughs> When you make a move on your wife, that's the first thing she's going to ask you. Also, tonight, uh, backstage uh, is on four, uh, 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern. Me and the God King, Jeremy Boring, uh, Ben Shapiro, and what's that guy, other guy's name? I forget, Knowles. Uh, he will be there, and we will all be talking about Earth Day because we are really, really, I'm, I'm so lying. Subscribe. You can ask us questions. Subscribe at a, the level of uh, All Access member or Insider Plus. We will send you two of these handcrafted solid gold uh, leftist tears tumbler. They don't look like they're solid gold because, of course, they're not. But they are fantastic, and they do keep my, they keep your stuff cold or hot for hours on end. I've been using them. You get all the good stuff. You get an ad-free experience on the website. You get three hours of the Ben Shapiro show. You get Ben's op-eds about the election. Uh, and you get to be in the mailbag, which is coming up. And as you will see, it will solve all your problems. So come to dailywire.com and subscribe and come on l- later to the backstage show at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. All right, mailbag. (laughs) All right. From (laughs) that was the worst music I've ever heard. What was that? Uh, From Anonymous. Um, I've been in an emotionally abusive marriage for 12 years. My husband is demanding, controlling, angry. He says the most awful things to me when he gets angry. And when he's not angry, he's demanding, controlling, emotionally manipulative. I didn't realize what was happening until about a year ago when he escalated to some minor physical abuse. Even then... I took several months of personal counseling, which I began after experiencing a major depression to help me begin to think clearly enough to really understand what was happening. We have two young children, five and seven, and I've tried to keep the marriage together for their sake. I'm now questioning whether staying together is even the right thing to do for the children. Uh, He's been getting emotionally unbalanced with our seven-year-old. 
Um, that's basically my question. What should I do for the children's sake? Would a broken marriage be more destructive for them by staying? Uh, thank you in advance for your answer, which I'm sure will solve all my problems. Well, this is one where I can't solve all your problems. It's going to be a mess. Uh, but basically, yeah, the marriage is over. And, uh, you know, this is the thing. You know, a lot of Christians believe once you're married, you're married. Uh, there's some evidence for this. You know, Jesus came down very hard on divorce. I come down very hard on divorce. Once your husband's beating you up, he's not your husband anymore. That's not marriage. Just because you say the words, just because you have the ceremony, doesn't make it marriage. Marriage is something you do. And when you are beating your wife, you are no longer married to her. You have lost her. You have lost the right to call yourself her husband. When you're not, God did not make you to be punched around. He did not make women to be punched around. That is not what they're there for. That is not the way you treat your wife. That is, is not a wife if you're, if you're beating her. To get out of this is going to be really hard. This is, you know, the cycle of abuse is that the guy hits you and then he's so, so sorry. And then he's nice to you for a while. And then he goes slowly gets back to getting angry again. And then he hits you again. And you're thinking when he's nice to you, you're thinking, well, gee, you know, he's so nice when he's nice. And the kids, he's the kid's father. And I don't want to break up a marriage. And then it, it got, happens again. And the cycle gets uh, tighter and tighter as it goes as well. What I would do, you're going to have to get out of this, and it's going to be a mess because he's going to be manipulative. He's going to say things. He's going to, you know, in the letter it says that you tried to get him to go to marriage counseling. He wouldn't do it. What I would do is before you do anything, I would consult an attorney. Uh, I would consult an attorney who is an expert in this because it's going to be a mess and you're going to have to do things uh, to protect yourself. And I, I don't know what they are. I'm not a, a, a lawyer. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But but go and talk to a lawyer about this because this is going to get worse. And it, yes, it is worse for your children to have a mom being knocked around than it is for them to be in cu the custody of their mother. Uh, this guy is unstable. He doesn't know he's unstable. There's something wrong with him. Uh, he, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it ne Abuse negates a marriage. It does. And so you got to get out. And uh, it's, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be really hard. He's, he's going to manipulate you. He's going to say anything he can. Uh, and you're going to have to protect yourself and you're going to have to get custody of those children because he shouldn't have them. So go consult a lawyer before you do anything else and um, and just commit yourself to it because it's going to be tough. And I'm sorry. I'm really sorry you have to go through it, but you have to go through it. Um, from Brandon, the great Andrew Clavin. My name is Brandon. I'm from upstate New York, and I keep having this overwhelming feeling of anger with what is happening to the United States. It first started with the impeachment, and now I see Democrat and Republican leaders abusing their power through this Kung flu epidemic. My point is, when do you feel Americans will have enough of the crap that big government shoves down our throats? Okay. Uh, first, let me give you a piece of advice, okay? If you have to, stop paying attention to politics. Just turn off the news for a while. Take a break. Uh, you can't live your life in a fury. Politics is a battle between sides. Pa politics is an ongoing back and forth fight. Sometimes, sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. They're always going to, there's a country of 330 million people in it. It's huge, right? It's not just, it's not Britain. Britain is the size of Oregon, right? This is a huge continent. There's always going to be stuff going on. And now with the internet, when somebody gets arrested in Idaho for playing with her kid, you see that on your computer at home. So it feels like it's happening to you. It feels like it's happening where you are. Things are never, usually not as bad as they seem. They're usually not as bad as where you are. Take a look at your own life. Stop looking at politics for a while. Take a look at your own life and see how it is. Are, are your freedoms being impinged? Is there somewhere where you, where government is making life hard for you? Is there something you can do about it? Is there action you can take? If you're going to walk around angry, all the time and ruin your life with rage. You shouldn't be paying attention to politics because it's always a fight. There are always wins and losses. There are always bad guys and good guys. There are always stupid people and smart people. If you can't take it without your life becoming a misery, don't, don't pay attention. This is not a time when revolutionary action is needed, okay? This is not a time when we have to storm the barricades. Revolutions, almost 100% of the time, make things worse. Almost 100% of the time. The reason they didn't in the American Revolution is because it was, was really more of a civil war and it was really 
British people saying to the British, you're not treating us like British people. We want to be British people on our own. And yes, it, it, there were revolutionary things that happened, like getting rid of a king. But those things happened almost uh, as a side issue. If George Washington had wanted to be king, he could have been king. So the revolutionary things that happened were in the keep in keeping with the traditions of British common law. And so they actually didn't have the kind of revolution that you often get when people take to the barricades. This is not a time for revolutionary action. It's a time for political action. If you can't take political action without uh, ruining your life with rage, don't do it. Step away. Step away for a month. Try, try stepping away for a month. Just don't read the papers for a month. Don't pay attention to the news for a month and see how your life goes. This is a bad time because we're all kind of, our freedoms are all kind of curtailed because of this stupid lockdown. But still, still, I mean, you see, you know, what happens when you're not paying so so much attention? Because politics, being part of politics is an art, and part of the art is not letting it ruin your life. Um, from Jeff, dear Lord Cubal of the Multiverse, um, I was raised Catholic, and my upbringing was wonderful. I participated Paid in Boy Scouts, was an altar boy, helped raise money for the Knights of Columbus. I was never abused and had nothing but good interactions with priests, nuns, and adults in my parish. However, I struggle with the abuses and corruption within the Catholic Church. For years, I have felt as if I am in the hallway described by C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, struggling to find the right door. I'm now in my late 30s and married to a Methodist. I'm in the military, so we move a lot and have a hard time staying with one congregation. As the head of the household, I feel like I'm not providing the decisiveness or religious guidance my family deserves while I flounder around trying to decide on the right path and which denomination to join the right path towards Jesus. My family is stuck floundering with me. Since a lot of this is Catholic centric, I would have asked Knowles, but that would have forced me to listen to Knowles. My family's salvation is important, but not that important. Of course not. You know, we all want to get to heaven, but if you got to listen to Knowles to do it, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, I actually feel there's a reason you wrote to me instead of Knowles. Knowles is a devout Catholic. It's the best thing about him. In fact, I think it's the only thing that we could praise about him. Uh, but he would tell you to be Catholic. He's, you know, he's very committed to this, and I'm not. I'm committed to Jesus. That's, what, that's where my commitment lies. I think you wrote to me because you want permission to leave. Uh, your wife's a Methodist. That's working for you. You have serious issues with the, um, with the corruption that is in the Catholic Church, and it is bad, and it is a problem. You, I feel, I, this is my feeling about what you're telling me. I feel that you want to leave because you think this would be the best thing, but you have guilt about it. You're connected to the Catholic Church. You were raised in it. You had a great time. You have guilt about leaving. Your wife doesn't want to become a Catholic. You want your kids to be worshiping. And, you, and so you're stuck. You're paralyzed. I become a Methodist. If I were you, I would become a Methodist. And the reason is that you're, you're right about your family. Your family should be worshiping God. Your family should be in a church. And if your wife doesn't want to become a Catholic, and if you have questions about being a Catholic, enough questions that you wrote to me instead of Knowles, which suggests to me that you kind of think it's time to go, but guilt is holding you, become a Methodist. You can always go back to being a Catholic when your kids are grown. It's not, it really is the most important thing is that you are in touch with God and that you're part of the body of Christ. And I know a lot of people are going to be angry. I said that, that they think that one religion is better than another. Maybe one religion is better than another. You know, I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying the most important thing is that you as a family unit are all together worshiping Christ. And that's the important thing. And I think it's going to be easier for both of you and answer questions faster because your kids are growing up. You want to answer the question and get the answer done and be decisive. As you said, be a Methodist. Your, your wife is comfortable there. Your kids will be comfortable there. You'll have guilt, but so what? You'll be worshiping God. God is going to be there. He's going to hear you and your kids will be where they should be. And I think that that's, that's the answer, especially, especially if you're in the military, and God bless you for your service. We all really appreciate that. But being in the military, you travel around a lot, and it's good to have a place where you can keep checking in that has some kind of uh, unity and uh, consistency to it. That's what I think. Um, and all my answers are guaranteed 100% correct, so that must be true. Um, from Anonymous, I'm currently attending a very small university with this conservative leaning. Um, that's why I chose to attend this place. At the start of the school year, I loved everything about the school, and I had a ton of friends, and I was really happy just to be there. Things started to change near the end. All of the people who I was close to stopped associating with me for seemingly no reason. I've tried to get involved with different things the school offers. I went through Greek Life Rush, was turned down by all the organizations, and it's not competitive. A few other things to be denied from those as well. I've lost the passion I once felt for the university and feel that I'm unwanted and do not belong? Should I change schools or should I stay because I align with the views of the school? 
Uh, thank you for your help. Save the Claven. Save the Claven. And don't forget to, to press like and send us comments because that helps save the Claven. Um, you know, you should not leave this school. You should find out what happened. I mean, things don't happen for no reason. You had a lot of friends and everything was great. And then all your friends deserted you and suddenly you can't get into any organizations. Uh, something went wrong. Uh, maybe a rumor went around about you. Maybe the rumor is true. Maybe it's not true. I don't know. But something happened, right? You got to find out what it is. Because if you go to another school, this is this could follow you. And, you know, there, mu- there must be something behind this. And you have to find out what it is. What I would do is I would go to one of the school's counselors. And he can do it on a, you know, a teleconnection, whatever, however you want to do it. But I would go to one of the school's counselors and describe the, situa- the situation to him or her and see if you can find out what it is that caused this defection, because it's a mass defection. There must have been something that they heard about you that they believe to be true. Maybe something that is true. I don't know that that has somehow alienated them from you. That's going to be there. I mean, if if there's some kind of rumor going around about you, that's going to be there no matter where you go. So you got to find out what it is and maybe work to expel it or work to change it about yourself. So it's not true of you anymore if it's true. Uh, And I just don't know. But you, you can't just go off with your tail between your legs because something happened to you and you need to find out what it is so it doesn't happen again. Uh, and I, I kind of feel like you might know. I'm just getting the sense and I'm making this up, but I kind of feel like you might know what happened and you're not telling me. Uh, but uh, if you do, you should find out if there's some way you can fix it either in the rumor mill or in yourself, whichever it requires. Uh, and if you need a fresh start, that's different. But if you get a fresh start, you're going to have to, you know, if you get a fresh start, it's going to have to be by cleaning out this problem first and then moving on. You don't want to just move on not knowing what happened or knowing what happened and not doing anything about it. I got to stop there. I'll be back with the Daily Wire backstage at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And I'll be back tomorrow with The Andrew Claven Show. I am Andrew Claven. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. For over a month, the left has insisted we lock down our country. Towns, cities, even whole states have ordered citizens to stay locked in their homes. But now that President Trump is applying that logic to the national level by locking down our borders, the left is up in arms. Foreign nationals can hop our fences and enter the country by the millions. But you can't take a simple walk around the neighborhood. Doesn't seem very fair. Then CNN's Chris Cuomo stages some Broadway caliber fake news before getting caught in the obvious lie. New York's Bolshevik Mayor de Blasio calls for a ticker tape pandemic parade, and an Earth Day co-founder murders his girlfriend. All that and more, check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.